Um, this is going to be curious in more ways than one. Um, this is Ted, uh, and Ted is a uh, beaver sculpture, and he's going to be the mascot for our talk, so we'll leave him right here. Um, and we're going to... Uh, uh, let me tell you, um, I'm going to use a whole bunch of these in the pictures, but let me tell you what a beaver sculpture is. A beaver sculpture are things I take out of the water or off the land, never off the dams or the, uh, or the lodges, clean them up a little bit and collect them. So that's Ted, and he's, uh, I christened him Ted for today, and he's going to be our mascot. I, I should say that these beaver sculptures that I'm using have not been exhibited at MoMA, at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. Um, but they're relentless and maybe they're curious, so maybe uh, with a little luck we'll, uh, we'll get there someday. So, um, I'm calling this Capturing the Curiosity of Beaver and it follows perfectly with the, uh, with the with we just heard, but not with that kind of charm. And I'm going to link kind of beaver sculptures with educating all kinds of adults, so we're going to start that way. Ted is curious, um, he's relentlessly curious, and beavers are relentlessly curious, and birds, uh, see if I can get this, uh, birds are relentlessly curious, and sharks are relentlessly curious, and uh, I think that's a wolf, uh, it's a, or a merwolf, like a mermaid, um, <laughs> um, and, um, and dragons, of course, are relentlessly curious, we've got a dragon there. So all these came out of the water um, as you uh, see them. Um, and, and this is Teddy, and that's his real name. Um, and Teddy is the most relentlessly curious dog you've ever seen in your life. Um, Teddy is going after stuff in the bathroom. Uh, Teddy is looking at the TED Talk on the screen. Uh, probably what he's doing right now. Um, and here's Teddy with Thomas. Uh, if any human, if any, sorry, if any living thing exceeds Teddy's uh, relentless curiosity, it's Thomas. Thomas is relentlessly curious. They're going, uh, the two of them are going after a piece of food, and I will not tell you who won or what he did with it. Um, uh, this is tame by Thomas' standards. Um, this is Toma, kind of uh, relentlessly curious about a salt and pepper shaker. By the way, almost all the photographs, other than of the uh, beaver sculptures, um, were non, with one important exception we'll get to, were not staged or posed. Uh, they're all uh, kind of natural, and most of them were actually taken before I even knew about the TED Talk. So these pictures are almost more collage. Uh, than, uh, than taken for the talk, but there are a few exceptions. Um, this is Laura, and Laura is, uh, is Tomas' uh, sister and Ted's, Teddy's uh, friend too, and she's looking at a spider and a bunch of little spiders, and she's very intrigued by that. Um, the, the problem is that kids grow up. That's what you just heard a moment ago, and that's what I'm getting into too. Kids grow up, they get distracted, they... Uh, they uh, like to wear jewelry and things like that, and eventually they become adults, um, and then they seem to lose their relentless curiosity, uh, sadly. Um, uh, here, by the way, is one of the reasons why. This is Alain with Thomas, um, and somebody's got to watch out for boats. Uh, somebody's got to deal with exams. Somebody's got to deal with bosses. Somebody's got to deal with traffic and look out for boats, uh, and that gets in the way of our relentless curiosity. Tama, you'll notice, uh, uh, never loses it. He's right there looking at things. He's got the tiller, so this could be a bit dangerous, but Alain is, watch Alain is watching out. So, so adults um, uh, just... Uh, kind of, they seem to lose it. I'm not referring to Alain specifically, obviously, but they seem to lose it. Um, but you know what? We all dream in color. Uh, every one of us dreams in color, so we don't lose it at all. Uh, we keep it, uh, but it's hidden somewhere. Um, and uh, uh, it's hidden there. It's hidden somewhere in our heads. In fact, to be more specific, it's hidden in our brains. You all know about left and right hemisphere, split brain, all that kind of stuff. So this is, uh, it may look like a rock because beavers actually, I was told by someone, the person who gave this one to me, that beavers, when they don't find rocks at the base of their dams, they make rocks. 
Um, and so this may look like a rock, but it's actually a human brain. Um, uh, and, it's, and the brain has two hemispheres, the, le the left and the right and so on. And one is more for visualization, uh, typically, and the other, depending on whether you're right-handed or left-handed, and the other is more for verbalization. Um, and so what happens uh, when uh, kids are small, they all do art. Um, they all paint, and this is Tama years ago, and they're all busy, you've all seen pictures like this. Um, but then one day, they've got to go to school. Uh, here's Laura's first day in school, and uh, it's actually just a few weeks ago this was shot. Um, and once they go to school, they learn reading, and they learn writing, and it can get in the way of their curiosity. So kids and all paint and do art until we're about six, and then most of us stop and never pick it up again. But some do, uh, and this is a, equivalent to the uh, curiosity going away. Now, this is a wonderful article that was written by two school teachers at the time in Calgary, Alberta. It's published in the Harvard Educational Review, and it's called A Curious Plan, Managing on the Twelfth. And it's about how you can bring back that curiosity in children, even in children. Th this article is about eight-year-olds. Um, and they're, uh, and they're uh, doing essentially what we've started to do for 40-year-old managers. Um, and that is to tap into their natural and their own experience and build education on their experience and build in terms of projects that the kids can relate to or the adults can relate to. So in the case of, uh, of children, it might be weather, it's something they can they can live with. And um, luckily for Laura, she's in a school that's really doing uh, this kind of thing. So let's talk about reanimating the relentless curiosity of adults. Um, the, the challenge in our management development programs at McGill, but also the challenge in any educational program for bachelors, masters, or anyone uh, else. Um, and I'm going to talk about kind of three different stages. Of, uh, of rekindling or reanimating. First is reflecting on our own natural experience. Um, tapping into the experience that we've lived, that we understand and we appreciate. Here's a couple of lovely quotes. One's from a poem by T.S. Eliot that said, we had the experience but missed the meaning. And the other is from Saul Alinsky in his book called Rules for Radicals. He said, most people don't accumulate bodies of experience. They go through life undergoing a series of happenings which pass undigested. Hap happenings become experience when they're digested, reflected on, and related to uh, general patterns and synthesized. Very nice quotes uh, about this. Now here's a, a, a typical beaver sculpture reflecting, head up in the air, kind of contemplating big thoughts, right? Um, and here's an adult. This is Ben in, a healthcare, in, our, in our healthcare program. And, and Ben is part of what, what we do every single morning in all our programs, which we call morning reflections. There's three, <coughs> excuse me, there's three stages to it. They have a book called an insight book. It's empty except for their name on it. And every morning, first thing, they sit at round tables. There'd be about 30 people in the class or more. <coughs> and they sit at tables about five each. Um, and they just reflect. <coughs> they write. They think about it. Um, and uh, one of the people who went through the program years ago from Lufthansa, um, w uh, she held up the book for her colleagues back at Lufthansa, and she said, this is the best management book I ever read. She wrote it. <coughs> shouldn't everybody's best book, management or otherwise, shouldn't everybody's best book be the one they write themselves based on their own natural experience? So, uh, second is, <coughs> is the sharing of insights <coughs> of that reflective reflection in cooperative communities of learning. Um, and I'll show you so, uh, a bit of a mouthful, but you'll see a very practical application of this. <laughs> this is the only one that's staged, obviously. Um, we got Teddy to sit still for about 10 seconds. Uh, we got Toma and Laura to sit still for about a minute. Um, by the way, if you feel someone crawling under your chair, that's Tama somewhere here. Um, so we got them to sit still for a little while, uh, but in no time, uh, this wasn't staged. They were running around the table. So <coughs> very hard to do sharing reflections when, when kids are more interested in, in the experience than, in the, than in, the, uh, in the happening than the reflection. But that's okay. Um, this is uh, Ben. 
Um, ben worked with the Inuit in northern Canada. <coughs> this is Ben at his table with William, who's uh, uh, from uh, Uganda, a World Health Organization, and Salman, <coughs> who works for, um, who's a, a surgeon in Kuwait. And, and they're sharing uh, their experience. So our classrooms don't look like, they don't look like this, for sure, but they don't look like U-shaped classrooms. They're, they're round tables in a flat classroom so people can share their experiences easily. And then we get them into a third stage, which is into a great big circle. Um, and, uh, and they kind of share their best insights in a big circle. Now, the, the tough part about this is to get the professor out of there. Uh, the professor wants to be, uh, you know, acknowledge who's going to speak and comment on every comment and so on. So, uh, so we whited out the professor. Actually, I, I came the day after um, and I got up like he's there and I said, uh, I'm in charge and I walked out of the room. Um, so they could, and then they came back and said, no, that's not fair. Uh, we want you in the room, but like everyone else. This is Carl, one of my colleagues. Ben is over here, by the way. This is Carl, one of my colleagues, who's sitting there like the other people and engaging uh, the, way, the way we like it to happen these days. So what we're doing is really building community. That obviously is, is a beaver's rendition of community, right? Um, and so what we're doing is building community. And we can argue that uh, an organization is really, a f an effective organization is really a community of human beings. It's not a collection of human resources. Um, and then that learning is carried into everyday life for impact. That's the third stage. So basically, you reflect personally, you share in a group, and then you go back to wherever you came from and use the, the, the learning. For example, uh, here's Tama and Laura. They've discovered uh, beaver sculptures, and they're bringing one home for Grandpa. So uh, this was last summer. So uh, there you have that. And here's Carlos. Carlos came to one of our programs, and uh, he sent us this, uh, this by email a, a little while later, and he said, you know, I like the sharing around the table so much that we put one in our factory in Mexico City, and now whenever we have a problem, we reflect around the table. Um, and, and another story is about Phil, who's a member of the family, who called and said, I'm having trouble developing my managers, I need to do something to help develop them, we have no budget, what can we do? So I said, basically, get them around the table, get them sharing things and so on. And uh, they did this with a vengeance, they met every couple of weeks uh, for... <coughs> <coughs> I ate a cookie, a dad's cookie before I start. Um, <laughs> never eat a dad's cookie before you give a talk. Um, <coughs> so uh, so uh, every couple of weeks they'd meet informally over lunch and they'd just share their experiences down, uh, bring uh, conceptual material and so on and so forth. So, so that's Phil and uh, it spread, it became like Amway with no money. The members of his group started to create their own groups uh, and Phil eventually built this into something sort of available for everybody. Um, this is uh, just to show you that back in the classroom we actually can get adults to do art. Um, so there you have adults doing art and it's quite possible. Um, and this is James. Um, and James, uh, it's a very interesting uh, story. James made this himself while everybody else was doing art, and he was part of that. Um, he did this, and he was very proud of, of his glasses. Um, James is the number two guy in the Kenyan Red Cross, and the Kenyan Red Cross is really one of the bright spots in the Red Cross uh, Federation internationally. So I wrote to James. This picture was taken about two weeks ago. Uh, I wrote to James last week. Uh, and I said, James, can we use the picture? It might be circulated, you know, uh, what do you think? And James said, it's okay to look silly now and again, now and then. Um, what more can I say? Thank you. <laughs>